final speaker. Thank you for the instruct uh, introduction. I'm very excited to be here, and uh, I'm thrilled that like uh, the only uh, topics that I'm interested were already spoken about, and there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of uh, talks that were introductory for my paper here. So last year around this, this time, I played a game called Return of the Obradin, and I was struck by it. And to be more precise, I was struck by its narrative. I don't want to assume that everyone played this game. It's quite a new one. And in short, it's a puzzle game uh, with a historical setting. It gives the player the role of an insurance agent um, going on a ship named Obradin, uh, which gets lost in the sea in 1803 and returns five years later with none of its 60 crew members alive on board. The player is then tasked with, the, with finding out the fates of the 60 people by deduction. The story behind this mystery, once unraveled, is actually not remarkable or unique. But what, it makes, what makes it striking for me was the narrative and how it was told. And the storytelling in this game wasn't only, like, on, wasn't only unlike any storytelling in any book or movie I could think of, but also different than the storytelling in many of the games I played. And that's why I started my current research on narrative and gameplay in video games. And today I would like to talk about how Return of the Obradin combines these two, narrative and gameplay instead of keeping a balance between them and takes advantage of its medium by transforming game mechanics into narrative techniques. In order to do this, I will start briefly by stepping into gameplay versus narrative discussion between narratologists and methodologists, both because I think a game like Return of the Obradin can bring a new perspective into this decade-old debate, and because some of the arguments from the both sides of, the, of this debate will be used in this presentation. Secondly, I will um, talk a little bit about detective games. Sarah already gave us an introduction yesterday, because um, I think Return of the Obradin as a detective game can't be only compared to games from other mediums, other genres, um, because it has a focus on the plot due to the na uh, nature of detective fiction. And then, finally, because Return of the Obradin's gameplay is very much about spatial exploration and detection, the game also makes use of environmental storytelling. So in the last part of my presentation, I will apply Henry Jenkins' models of narrative architecture to Return of the Obradin. Let me start by a brief definition of gameplay and game mechanics. I like Sebastian Dom's definition, and I didn't know that he would be my chair <laughs> when I wrote this paper. So, he argues, the idea of gameplay is that a game can only be experienced as a game through an, active, through an active participation. This participation is in the form of actions that are chosen by the player. In order to qualify as a game, the range of options, as well as the in-game consequences of these choices and actions, must be prescribed by a set of rules that together form the game mechanics. So, video games have one, active participation of its audience, and two, a set of rules, also known as game mechanics. But what about the story? According to many scholars, for example, for Jenkins, quote, many games do have narrative aspirations, or as, as Jasper Jewell notes, obviously many computer games do include narration or narrative elements in some form. But Jewell also argues that, quote, Computer games are not narratives because the narrative part is not what makes them computer games. Rather, the narrative tends to be isolated from or even work against the computer gameness of the game. Jules is, of course, neither the first nor the so uh, only scholar who defines video games as non narratives. And since the academic interest in video games started increasing, the question has been basically the same. Are video games some set of rules and interactions, or are they a new form of narrative? I, of course, won't have the time to discuss the dichotomy in detail, 
and it's also not the scope of, of, in my, of my paper to find a place for video games in the academia, but I still think some of the um, arguments from both sides of this discussion, especially Jules Klein, uh, Jules, Jules Klein that I underlined here, highlighted, is important for my argument because I am arguing that the gameplay can enhance the narrative in Return of Tio Britain and in some other games as well, but, I, but I'm looking how it works here and for this game. And I think it doesn't really matter which side you take in this discussion for this paper, because whether you accept video games as non-narratives with narrative elements or narratives with gameplay and rules, I believe one thing is still clear. Not all video games make use of the narrative elements to the same extent. As John Edry notes, not all games have a story to tell. Some video games make uh, very little or no use of narrative to narrative elements, such as Tetris, in which you control falling blocks. And one might argue that this is already what the narrative is about, but it would still make this game very abstract. And the narrative, the narrative here is not very interesting to the game. On the other hand, there are some games like Gun Home, which the critics and some people would claim it's not a game, but it's just an interactive story. And they are on the other side. They make use of narrative elements so much that the gameplay is not that much in front. However, I argue most games with puzzle or problem solving as challenges tend to balance their narratives and gameplay, and they often have a structure in which the player is presented one part of the game, where the, gameplay, uh, where the gameplay is prioritized, followed by another part where the story is, the narrative is prioritized, and then again a part with more gameplay than narrative and so on. Maybe the most obvious example would be Nintendo Super Mario Bros. And the parts where the player can interact with the game mechanics in order to defeat enemies or find a way through obstacles and move to the next platform don't have that much to do with the story. But the story is only given as cutscenes after you overcome that challenge. I think this can also be an example of narrative and gameplay combination in which the narrative part does, in fact, work against the gameness, as Jules argues, because in a game like this, the player just wants to continue playing and doesn't want to hear the story, especially if you already know the story and you're playing the game for a second or third time. I think in order to avoid this, the video game can have a more sophisticated story than the one in Super Mario Bros. So let's look at one. The first person puzzle game Portal, probably becoming a J.J. Abrams movie soon, has a more complex narrative and an innovative gameplay for its time. However, when it comes to putting them together, I don't think it's that much different than Super Mario Bros. To make it clearer, imagine I have a scenario. Imagine that uh, you are stuck in a level or chamber in Portal and a friend wants to help you. What you would have to explain to them would be that you can jump, move, and you're trying to reach the door. And you can open portals, pick up objects, and stuff like that. So the rules of the game, but not the story. You wouldn't have to say anything about the evil AI that traps you in this building and who you are. In other words, your friend would only have to know the rules and not the story. So let's go back to the Return of the Oberdin and how, let's see how the mechanics in Return of the Oberdin function. In this game, there are actually only three actions that you can take. You can either move your player character and look around by also moving the camera or you can approach a corpse and you can use your pocket watch, which takes you to a vignette-like scene of the very moment that person died. I thought it's a little bit hard to imagine how this works, so I will show a little clip. You bastards may take exactly what I give you! Come on before she kicks off. Here, let me help you. 
to spoil the game too much for the people who still want to play it. I convinced a couple of people, Jared and Stefan <laughs> at least. <laughs> so I try to go back. No. What's this? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe from here. So when you use your pocket watch approaching a dead body, you will uh, go into a memory uh, of that person, the last moment of that, but that will be a still scene. And first you hear the audio, the trailer shows it like you hear the dialogue during the scene, but it's just a silent scene, and uh, silent and still scene. So you're kind of in a 3D picture. And you can walk around, you can't interact with the objects, and then once you observe the notebook in the game, well, note down the location of the dead body and the people that was in this 3D image. So it, it's more like a vignette that you can travel in. And the audio part is very short. You hear the last seconds of the dialogue, if there's any, during the death. And your notebook will also have that dialogue written down. And there's audio used for it because sometimes the accents of the people or their voices, female or male, can give you a clue about the identity of the people. And then once you get out of that memory, the game actually forces you to go back. You can't stay in the memory for that long, but you can revisit it. And you can uh, use your notebook to look at the notes about the memory and you can fill in uh, information about what happened to these people. That's uh, an example from a memory. For example, this guy here is being executed, but you don't know who that is. And um, you can move around and observe the faces of the other people, and you can deduct who this person can be. But of course, the memories are also not independent from each other, so you might have to return to another memory first to understand this scene better. And then once you're back and the, your notebook opens automatically, it will ask, ask you the two questions for every 60 member on the ship. So the two questions would be, who is this and how did they die? So the third thing you can do in the game would be use the notebook. So I want to here quickly turn back to the scenario where your friend tries to help you with a puzzle in Portal and try to apply the same scenario to Return of the Obridian. Uh, if someone wants to help you who and they never played this game, you would have to explain them uh, some rules to uh, help them assist you, but they could never be independent from the story. You could say you can use your notebook, you can go to the scene, but then they would already know about the story. So without paying attention to the narrative, you can't do anything in the game. It's impossible to beat without actually paying attention to the narrative. And these interactions would only be meaningful if you are paying attention. Moreover, there are no independent puzzles in Return of the Oberdin, as I said. All of the fates of the crew members are connected to each other. and you just revisit the scenes to connect them. However, as I said before, Return of the Oberdin is often defined as a detective game, unlike the other examples I talked about, Portal and Super Mario. And since traditional detective games often make use of whodunit narrative, as Sarah showed us yesterday, it's not uncommon for the gameplay to serve the purpose of investigation and revealing a story. And for this reason, comparing Return of the Obridian to only games from other genres would not be fair, I think. That's why now I will look a little bit into detective games and show you some more examples among them. 
Although Jenkins argues that if some games tell stories, they are unlikely to tell them in the same ways that the other media tell stories. Because, quote, um, stories are not empty content that can be ported from one media pipeline to another. I still see, um, when I start my research on detective games, I still see games that are so similar to the way movies are told that they can be easily adapted into movies, I think. And of course, there's still an interac interactive part in these games, but they usually depend on uh, multiple choice to test the people's, uh, to the player's attention to the narrative. And the story tends to be linear in games like Lainoa or Sherlock Holmes adaptations. I will show an example from Telltale Games, The Wolf Among Us. He, uh, here the player is tasked with choosing one of the four options as their next sentence in a dialogue and their choice will affect the outcome. So you, you have to choose one of these. You can say nothing if you press X or you can ask one of the other three questions. And all the Wolf Among Us is a little bit different because you will get a different ending. Uh, that turns out to be not that different at the end. But um, in Sherlock Holmes games, for example, if you choose one and it's not the right answer, in the very recent one where you try to um, guess if the person lies, for example, you will choose a sentence and then the game will tell you to choose another one because it's not the right answer. And the uh, one problem with this type of player interaction is that the player can simply guess the correct answer or hear the best outcome. You can just guess or you can play the game again and you can just uh, choose, the, choose something that you didn't choose before. And as Mark Brown argues, quote, in detective games with multiple choice questions, the player is completely prompted by the potential answers and they are not coming up with their own thought, but simply looking for the answer that sounds most sensible. And therefore, by helping the player too much, the game mechanic limits the, own, limits the game's own interactivity. And, um, and doesn't strengthen the, pl the player's role as an investigator. And as I man mentioned before, in Return of the Oberdin, the two questions that players have to answer 60 times are who is this person and how did they die? The amount of possible answers to the questions uh, is nearly impossible for the player to simply guess, because for who is this person, you would have 60 options out of the crew manifesto list. And for how did they die? you can have even more because um, this person might be murdered by someone else and then you would have to find a name for him around, uh, among the 60 possible answers and then uh, which way he was killed and then the attacker's name. So the artificial intelligence is not quite there yet to provide the player with any answer that they can give, any name or any way that they can kill. So there are still options, but it's just impossible to guess. And I believe this type of mechanic in comparison to a multiple choice questionnaire forces the player into thinking more about the narrative by giving them the freedom and time to investigate at their own pace, instead of making them choose the correct answer out of given options. Clara Fernandez Vara, in her study on, game based on games based on Sherlock Holmes stories, and looks in, uh, also looks into the multiple choice questions in Sherlock Holmes games, and notes that this is very game-like. I quote: "Creating a mystery like that can be more of an exercise in storytelling than actual game design. Digital games have the affordances to create environments that tell a story, which the player can in interpret selectively and reconstruct the story." And I believe Return of the Oberdin doesn't only provide the player with more options to its questions than similar games, it also takes advantage of its medium by creating an environment that Fernandez Vera here mentions. And that's what brings me to the final part of my paper. Uh, in, her another, uh, in another study of hers, Fernandez Vera discussed game spaces and spatial narrative and suggests that detective games use a strategy called indexical storytelling, 
And the detectives in these games read the environment looking for clues as the first thing they do. In Return of the Obradin, environmental hints are a great part of the puzzles, as the only other clues player can find are the page list, the, the page with the crew manifest, and the bit of audio dialogue before every memory or vignette scene. Jenkins, on the other hand, suggests a framework of four ways in which video games with environmental storytelling code create the preconditions for an immersive narrative experience. I think Return of Joe Redden utilizes especially two out of these four models Jenkins mentions. These two would be enacting stories and embedded narratives. Jenkins explains the first one as spatial stories providing staging ground where players can enact narrative events. Narrative events. This happens to Return of Joe Redden as in this first person game, the player character is the insurance agent, so that's the role, and the player is tasked with this investigation. Moreover, unlike in games based on Sherlock Holmes stories, Return of the Abridden doesn't have a main character with existing detection skills, and so in Sherlock Holmes games, we know that Sherlock Holmes knows things that we don't know. But here, we are the only person responsible for solving this case, so we have nothing given. And, and the player only provides the, and the player is only provided with the um, different spaces, and where they can observe the environment and use their own detection skills. There is no information provided about the investigator; he or she has no name, and the player can only see the character's hands and gloves. So we know nothing about the player character, and the investigator only speaks in the. Intro, intro scene actually, and um, the voice of the speaker can be female or male at random. I didn't know about that on my first run, it was male and then for this research I wanted to take some screenshots and I started again, it was female, and it's just random. And I think all of these details contribute to the player's performance and enactment of the given role, so it gives you the feeling of enactment. And Return of the Obedient also makes use of another model of Jenkins' narrative framework, which Jenkins calls embedded narratives. And as he explains, this, this is when special stories code uh, embed narrative information within their mise-en-scene. And Jenkins argues that a game with embedded narratives is not linear. Instead, it reveals its story gradually as the player moves through narrative action. Return of the Overridden story also starts with the very end, as the first body found aboard the ship chronologically belongs to the last person to die. I'm sorry for the spoiler, <laughs> but it's very minor. In addition to the pocket watch and memories, um, in addition, the pocket watch and memories that the player can visit also create space for embedded and micro narratives. And the player can use the pocket watch in order to choose a moment in which they might uh, want to observe more clues. And the memories, as I said before, can be revisited again and again, and there is no certain order to do that. Moreover, some of these scenes can only be discovered through another one. And there, is an, there is no uh, strict order, but some of them can only be discovered if you first go into another one, and then you will find a body that doesn't really exist on the ship, but only in the memory. Uh, so I think that's also a way to embed micro-narratives into embedded narratives. And this way, even though the player character stays on the ship through the entire game, only in the intro and the last cutscene you're outside of the ship, but during all the gameplay you are on board. And, uh, but you can still observe events from any time and space. To conclude, this kind of spatio-temporal manipulation in Son of the Obradin, along with its detective detection mechanics that force the player to spend more time actually thinking on the information that the narrative provides, and therefore really perform as the investigator. Uh, that creates a narrative that is hard to imagine in a medium without interactivity. Thank you for listening. <laughs>